Welcome to episode 191 of The Brainy Business, Understanding the Psychology of Why People Buy. In today's episode, I'm delighted to introduce you to Dr. Rachel Laws to share about her new book, Using Semiotics in Retail. Ready? Let's get started. You are listening to The Brainy Business Podcast where we dig into the psychology of why people buy and help you incorporate behavioral economics into your business, making it more brain friendly. Now here's your host, Melina Palmer. Hello, hello, everyone. My name is Melina Palmer, and I want to welcome you to the Brainy Business Podcast. I love all my guests and all the topics on this show. And sometimes there's something that comes up that gets me just beyond fascinated. I get to be all super brainy and nerdy and it sticks with me for weeks after digging in and learning about it. This is one of those episodes and it is because of the entire field of semiotics. Signs, symbols, and brain associations and how they impact businesses and buying decisions. It is truly fascinating. Like the Da Vinci Code meets business strategy. When I was introduced to Dr. Rachel Laws by recent guest, Alina Hallinan, and I got to check out her first book, Using Semiotics in Marketing, and then an early read of this new book of Using Semiotics in Retail, I was hooked and knew I had to, had to, had to share it with you all here on the show. Rachel's here to talk about the ins and outs of semiotics and some fun stories about how they impact us all the time, even when we might not realize it. There are, of course, links for you to get your own copy of Using Semiotics in Retail and Using Semiotics in Marketing, as well as other books, episodes, and links either called out directly or related to the content in the episode, as well as to connect with Rachel, all within the show notes for the episode, which are waiting for you within the app you're listening to or at thebrainybusiness.com slash 191. Those already on the Brainy Business list got a direct link from me in the email you receive every Friday. Not on the list yet? Simply sign up for any freebie at thebrainybusiness.com and you'll be automatically added. The freebie for this episode is the first chapter of my award-winning book, What Your Customer Wants and Can't Tell You. And if you already have the book, in which case, thank you, you'll also be automatically added to the list when you get your copy of the free PDF companion workbook. Both are housed in our free behavioral economics community called the Be Thoughtful Revolution. There's a link to join that global community in those show notes as well. All right, let's jump right in. Dr. Rachel Laws, welcome to the Brainy Business Podcast. Hello, thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. I'm so excited to have you here. And we're going to be talking all about semiotics. And as we get into that, though, you know, before we get there, I would love if you can, you know, tell the world listening a little bit about you and your background and how you got into the field. Yeah, it's a great question. I guess I started out, I started out a long time ago, but my career started out in academia. I'm a social psychologist. What you need to know about social psychologists as opposed to other types of psychologists is that we don't spend that much time worrying about what's inside people's heads. You know, I'm certainly not clinical. I don't do therapy. I don't spend a lot of time speculating about how people's brains are structured. As a social psychologist, we are all about um, relationships and how people communicate with each other. And uh, when I, um, so I did a PhD and um, then I moved um, to London from the Midlands. London's full of marketing people and advertising agencies and brand owners. And uh, I started to supply um, this um, service, which is called Semiotics Professionally, because um, brands want, desperately want to be able to communicate with people, right? And that was what I was a specialist in, in how people make sense of the things that they say to each other, you know? So uh, I guess that's what I started to do. So semiotics, how is that different from other sort of approaches to communication? So semiotics starts, I guess, starts out from the view that people, usually in conversation with each other, just like the conversation that we're having now, actively and cooperatively sort of build and construct versions of reality, you know? So even though you and I don't know each other very well, in this conversation right now, we're cooperatively together building a certain version of reality in which the world is like this and we agree on that right and marketing is like x y and z and we're they're going to be shared references from pop culture that we both understand right 
So the, the overall approach is like that. And what's special about semiotics is that it's really good with not only words and how language works, but also it's really good with um, visual images and sounds and all that type of thing. And you will hear these referred to as semiotic signs. So what's a semiotic sign? Well, um, I, was, I once had the privilege of being in um, Chicago right at Christmas time. And it was the very first, it was snowing and it was beautiful <laughs> on the Golden Mile in Chicago. And it was the very, very first time that I'd ever seen a Salvation Army Santa outside of a department store. I knew that they existed, that people from Salvation Army would ring bells outside the department stores at Christmas time. Because I'd seen it on TV and in Hollywood movies. Right. It was the first time I'd ever seen it in real life. And it was really quite emotional and packed quite a punch. Right? So that right there, the, the bell ringing, the sound of the bell ringing, but also the sight of somebody dressed up in a Santa costume is a semiotic sign. The sound of the bell is a semiotic sign. The snow, and all of that stuff, and the and the of course you know in the United where well, I'm I'm in London right. Our taxi drivers here are fond of saying that um, this city was built for horses, not for cars. It's a very old city, very narrow streets, as you know, because you've been here, right? Yeah. I was in Chicago, like in comparison, the streets are a mile wide. <laughs> <laughs> so even something like the width of a street can be a semiotic sign. And so semiotics is the study of how people interpret and make sense of signs. And then I give advice to brand owners and advertisers on how they can build semiotic signs like wide streets and bells and Santa costumes into their marketing so that they can convey the desired sort of message with their brands. How is that? Was that a good enough explanation? Oh, yeah, I love it. And don't worry, listener, we're going to be digging more in on the signs and, and symbols and things. And I know I had mentioned to Rachel, you know, in advance, like, is it going to be like, can I mention Dan Brown? Are we going to be getting into <laughs> weird stuff here? Because I know it's more of like a pop culture version of this. But for anybody who does like the Da Vinci Code and Angels and Demons and all those and this uh, talk of, you know, Robert Langdon and those signs and symbols and how that helps him through, um, you know, journeying of solving stuff or any of these, right, national treasure, all these, you know, n understanding that sort of stuff in history is base is I don't want to say basically what we're talking about here. However, it's like a, a pop culture version of helping us to be introduced of like why this is going to be a super interesting conversation. Oh, I love pop culture. I think about <laughs> pop culture all the time. <laughs> I spend a lot of time on Reddit and Twitter and I love to know what's going on. And whenever there's something is trending or there's a scandal breaking or so there's a you know huge twitter pile on of the day i always want to look at that because it's always full of semiotic signs all the time did you um just out of interest did you follow that whole saga um last january with gamestop yeah but go ahead and elaborate because we don't know when people will be listening to this so yeah 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 so let's tell our listeners so what happened folks to us that um so the stock market, it's meant to be serious, right? <laughs> you're supposed to, there's rules that you're supposed to follow, and that's why we have hedge funds and people who are experts in wealth management and stuff like that, right? It's not for kids. <laughs> right. Except one day it was. <laughs> 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 and so I wrote about this in, the, in, in my book, actually, which we can discuss. So there, there was and is this uh, company called GameStop, a fine company, um, with headquarters in Texas, and they are a retail chain that um, sells video games, physical copies of video games and hardware, you know, the consoles and stuff, right? And and people had been saying rather sort of um, a bit meanly that it was going to go the same way as Blockbuster, you know? Because mm -hmm. right. people download their video games now. There's no need to buy a physical copy. The same with your hardware. You can just order it online, right, if you're lucky anyway. Right? There's, why would you need to go to a store? Yeah, I don't need to be sending out CDs of the podcast. Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So it seemed that um, GameStop didn't have a bright future and, the, and probably it would have been left to, to its own fate, except that some hedge funds started to interfere in the situation mm -hmm. by shorting the stock. And what, that, what I learned, what that means, is that they were essentially placing bets that the business was going to fail, right? So if the business failed, they made money. Now. On Reddit, <laughs> which, as everyone knows, is the centre of the universe, sure, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's a group there called uh, Wall Street Bets, and it is a group subreddit for um, people who are 
what's called um, casual retail investors. So they're not um, finance professionals. They're just ordinary people, you know, kind of pizza delivery guys and, you know, mothers and w- ordinary working people, all right, honest, good, honest working people who are not wealthy and don't have de- MBAs and degrees in finance, right? And when they found out what was going on with those hedge funds, deliberately trying to essentially, deliberately trying to undermine a brand and a store which had been quite well loved amongst this group, because let's bear in mind that there's a big overlap between Reddit users and video gamers, right? So they were not happy about this. And so um, they kind of organised, I want to, well, I don't, I don't, I, we have to be careful about this stuff because it's kind of legal language, but essentially, by sheer coincidence, <laughs> and not in an organised way at all, <laughs> we think millions of users and readers of Reddit went on the stock market and bought shares in GameStop. With the result that by January of this year, it was one of the most high-ranking businesses in the world <laughs> in terms of the value of its shares. I have to say that uh, as well, that um, at first I was just there to observe, you know, I just wanted to look. But as a, as a researcher, uh, which is what I am first and foremost before I give marketing advice to brands, I wanted to have the experience. And so after a period, at first, for the first couple of weeks, I was just there to watch. After a couple of weeks, I bought some shares because sometimes things are easier to understand if you've got skin in the game. Mm -hmm. But later, it was the most fun I've had in 12 months. (laughs) It was the most fun I'd had since the pandemic started. It was heart-stoppingly exciting. Right. Heart-stoppingly exciting. So at the time that I joined Wall Street Bets, when I joined it, it had 2 million members, which is already good, right? Within 10 days, they'd got 9 million members. Nine million people posting every day. The, there was a euphoric atmosphere. People were saying that they'd never felt so alive, that um, they could. They just had to boot up Reddit and they could feel the adrenaline kicking in, you know. People were absolutely drunk on this cocktail, a really powerful cocktail, which consisted of um, a massive sense of humour, um, a sense of fellowship uh, amongst uh, members of Wall Street Bets and quite a strong sense of kind of sticking it to the man, you know, getting one over on these these, these wealthy hedge funds that were callously trying to put a left company out of business. So we're nearly a year on now and rather miraculously, the um, GameStop shares have managed to retain most of their value. Um, I'm certainly holding mine <laughs> for right. the time being. And, uh, of course, the GameStop's really happy. You know, they've got a new chief executive, Ryan Cohen, who's doing great things. I believe they've just hired um, or poached even 250 employees from Amazon. And, I'm, you know, I'm kind of optimistic for them and so are a lot of other people. So, for me, this was a huge good news story. But it was also the kind of thing that I take an interest in from a semiotics point of view because it's a great story about business it's also a story about how people create meaning amongst themselves and so every single day on on wall street bets do you know nine million members in 10 days that's a lot of people who don't know each other at all and yet just really through the power of language and a few memes there was a tangible sense of unity and fellowship and i want to say brotherhood amongst those people mostly mostly guys right and you could really feel it the air was absolutely thick with that you know, and most um, most of my um, clients who are consumer facing brands in many different sectors would kill for customers to have even a fraction of that depth of feeling. You know, so this attracted my attention very much. So this is what I do. I just notice interesting things happening with brands and consumer culture, and then I'll go and track it down and find out what's going on and where's the where's the magic formula, so to speak. And then I help my clients to understand how that works so that how they can be as lucky as GameStop has been. Yeah. So with the GameStop story, there are quite a few things that I noted from the behavioral economics concept, behavioral science point of view. So we have hurting there for sure, right? So seeing that everyone else is doing uh, something and the social proof that we want to jump on that as well. You get optimism bias of thinking you're going to win and the excitement with the dopamine that you're getting and anticipating if it's going to work out well. You also have availability bias because you're seeing it all over the place. And so then you're feeling like it's much more popular than it is and then it becomes even more popular than it is. And I also made a note of 
in this episode is going to come out in February of 2022 for when your new book comes out. We're recording at the end of 2021. And so in November of 2021, there will have been an episode <laughs> that is on The Power of Us, which is an amazing book that came out in fall of 2021, uh, but talking about how people collectively can come to make this grouping like you were talking about and to where we uh, work together and feel like a part of the group. So I did mention a ton of episodes in there that are all past episodes of the podcast that will be linked for everyone to go back to. So to learn more about this amazing story, definitely check that out. Thank you. And then what are then the semiotics that are involved there that layer on top of that from the GameStop perspective? So what I noticed, amongst other things, one of the first things that I noticed when I started to hang out on Wall Street Bets with its population growing by the day, and again, we're talking literally millions of people here, you cannot possibly have any relationship to each other apart from having jumped on the story, you know. And yet I noticed how quick everybody was to kind of use um, the tools of language to create a sense of group identity. So um, everybody referred to themselves as apes. Men and women alike, the apes of the apes of uh, WSB, right? Um, and they also talked a lot about crayon eating, right? <laughs> there was a lot of talk about I'm so stupid that I eat crayons, right? right. And I'm a smooth brained ape, right? And it it became these ideas about apes and and crayon eating uh, spread through the group like wildfire. Everybody used it, you know. And it was a technique for creating a sense of unity amongst the amongst the group. What was really special about it, what I really loved about it was this, because we were just talking just now about kind of irrational decisions and bias, you know. Here's what I think was really, what really moved me about the whole situation, was that at the time, of course, because they caused absolute havoc on the stock market. I mean, they managed, as far as I remember, they managed to bankrupt at least one hedge fund. Right? <laughs> so this had serious real world consequences, right? Where hedge funds don't expect to be bankrupted by gangs of marauding retail investors, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so... At the time, it was getting a lot of attention in the financial press and finance journalists and people, you know, who'd got finance degrees were um, all saying the same thing. They were saying, this is very risky. We're very concerned. There's a lot of people out there who can't aff- haven't got much money and can't afford to lose it. They're being they're jumping on this like lemmings jumping off the edge of a cliff and they're going to lose all their money. And we're very, very concerned. <laughs> and that was the, that was the, that was the angle, you know. And and the, the kind of beauty and genius of um, of Wall Street Bets as a collective was that they were simply not playing by the same rules. In their view, any outcome was a good result, and this was completely beyond the grasp of the the people who studied finance at university. They were like, "But wait, there's rules. You're supposed to buy low, sell high, and make some money. That's how you play the game." WSB were like, no, that's how you play the game. Right. <laughs> we're, there's nine million of us and we can play the game any way we want, <laughs> you know. And so um, there was this was what was really kind of revolutionary about their approach was that they were like, well, you know, on the one hand, there was this huge appetite for um, success and wealth and people would say, like, we're all going to the moon with Elon Musk, you know. At the same time, uh, there was people were perfectly sanguine about the possibility of losing their money. And let's not forget that we're talking about retail investors here, right? Like most people actually were not investing their life savings. You've just got nine million pizza delivery boys investing a, a couple of hundred dollars, you know? Right. A substantial amount, actually, if the way you earn a living is delivering pizza, but still not enough to screw up the rest of your life. Sure. But they could afford to lose that, you know, which the hedge funds couldn't, not in the billions of dollars that they were hemorrhaging, you know? And so um, it gave Wall Street Bets great um, immunity because they simply changed the rules of the game. They said any outcome is a good outcome. And the stock market was not designed for that philosophy. And so it caused it caused mayhem. And I, I kind of quite like a bit of mayhem because it, <laughs> it reveals some new things that we haven't seen before, you know. Yeah, interesting opportunities to study for sure. Yeah, definitely. So as we get into some other um, you know, stories from the new book, of course, all would be fair game since this is your first time here on The Brainy Business. And so I know your first book is Semiotics in Marketing, which came out in March of 2020, right? That's right. <laughs> uh, and then, which, you know, 
amongst some other things that happened then. I can't remember exactly what. But, uh, and then uh, your new book, Semiotics in Retail, is coming out February 2022. And so I got an advanced copy and I love it. And thank you so much for sharing. I've also, I'm like deciding like, maybe my PhD will be in semiotics. Like, what would that be? Oh, do it. Absolutely. hundred percent. Oh, I know. I'm ex- I'm excited. I've also been talking a lot with uh, the folks at Olson Saltman and they do work with metaphor research. And so I'm like, oh, these, this area is so, I just think amazingly fascinating. But at the very beginning of semiotics and retail, you start off with a story about a jam business. Mm. And <laughs> I think it is such a fantastic example of how not thinking properly about semiotics can derail everything. And so can you share a little bit about that story? Yeah, I would love to. This was one of my favorite projects. It was just a really small one as well. You know, it wasn't like a worldwide study of 18 different brands. It was one store in one street in one country, you know, but owned by a large business, so whose um, whose name we we will we will disguise, right. so as not to embarrass them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we protect the innocent. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So then, this is a great example of exactly what I do, right? Just on a small small scale, you know. So this company, they make jam or preserve, as it's, they they might call it properly, and it's very luxurious uh, product, right? It's got loads. It's not. It's got loads of fruit in it. It's dense and thick, and it's really luxurious stuff right and they do loads of flavors and they've got a great um story to go along with the product about how it was rooted in sort of elegant uh, european history and uh, they were selling this stuff online of course but they'd they'd um invested quite a bit of money in renting a physical store uh, right here in london in one of the most historic bits of london and you can imagine why they would do that, right? Because it just helped to kind of back up this brand story about uh, European elegance and history and heritage and all that stuff, right? So they knew they were trying to be dignified and historical. And so they made some very kind of careful design decisions, you know. It's hard to describe these things just verbally without um, images, but let's just say it didn't look like Chuck E. Cheese. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Not that so not nothing wrong with Chucky Chase, but it didn't look like that, right? It was more um restrained, right? More classical. They had a lot of black on the walls and um they had the brand's name just picked out in these really delicate uh, golden letters, not so much gold, less is more, you know, that kind of <laughs> approach. Nice creamy stone tiles on the floor. And these um various cabinets and shelves were all matching and were done in this um pale wood with these little brass details on the fittings you know and it was incredibly careful and outside the store in the window they'd got um this interesting curved window outside uh with some basically plinths with their jars of jam sitting on these plinths to make them look special which they if they did look special you know so it was all very careful you know shop fitting and de- design the problem was that it wasn't selling no one wanted to go in there never mind buy any jam (laughs) (laughs) and my client was confused because it was such a good location and it was a nice brand that people liked so what's wrong with this store why is it keeping people away right so i said can you go down there and have a look this is the sort of thing that i have this is what i do you know people call me up and say we're having a problem we don't know why could you go down and have a look right (laughs) so i went down there with my camera to find out what was going on and um i took a lot of photos uh, I kind of had my spidey sense was tingling, you know, Melina. I had a feeling that there was something a bit off about this place. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but I took a bunch of photos of this carefully designed store. And then I went back to my desk and I asked myself a question, which is a central question in semiotics, which is where have I seen this before? And you can often, if you've got a photo, you can often answer that question by just going and doing a bit of searching around on Google Images. What I learned when I looked at my photo set and asked myself where have I seen these before and verified it with an internet search was that um, the whole place absolutely reeked of death. <laughs> the whole store <laughs> absolutely just had the stench of death all over it. <laughs> <laughs> where were they going wrong? Well, firstly, it was reminiscent of a funeral parlour, okay? So maybe your funeral parlours in the US are similar to the ones that we have in the UK. So often what we've got in the um, the British funeral parlour 
is that there will be, I noticed this with the, the window display that I was describing with the plants. So often a funeral parlour in this country, we all have like thick carpet, thick curtains. There's no windows, no natural daylight, such because you don't want passers-by coming in, staring in at the, the scene, you know. And you'll have like a central plinth and then your casket or your or whatever is containing the body will sit on top of that, right? So they'd successfully created a funeral parlour in their in their exterior window, which was unfortunate. <laughs> <laughs> and then it just kind of got worse as you went into the store. So the jars of product, the, these lovely jars, but the exact shape of urns that you would have at people's ashes in, the exact, that exact shape. And they'd got rows and rows and rows of these things, not nicely arranged on shelves. On these, remember, they're using black wood shelves and very restrained decorations. There's no, there's nothing flowery about this store. It's all very sombre and very restrained. And we've got rows and rows and rows of urns. So a useful word here that I don't think my client had heard before is columbarium. <laughs> so a columbarium is a word is a word that means exactly that. <laughs> it's a, it's a room which stores urns, funerary urns full of ashes, rows and rows and rows of them. So they created a columbarium in the store, you know. And then it just went it just went on and on. It just went from bad to worse. Like those pale wood fittings that I mentioned with the little brass fixtures, funeral caskets, the exact, the exact wood, exact fixtures. It was even the building itself was like a crypt. It had these low, they're called cantilevered ceilings. Do you know the ones that are kind of like an arch, but it comes to a point at the top, you know? Mm -hmm. And the stone floor. So they'd managed to include in this one little tiny store, they'd managed to design in a funeral parlour, <laughs> crematorium, um, a columbarium and some <laughs> and some caskets. It was horrific. Even their staff were wearing black suits like undertakers. I had to, I would just went back to the client and showed them these two sets of photos side by side, the ones I'd taken and the ones that I collected. I was like, what's going on? <laughs> Why have we got jam of death, shop of death? <laughs> I'm not, I'm, I'm, I kind of feel like this might be putting off people buying food. They were like, oh, yeah. <laughs> Pretty soon after that, we fixed it, you know, and uh, I said, look, if you want to tell a story about old historical Europe, there are so many better ways to do that, you know. And it was Some of it was very decorative and colourful and, you know, people in the 18th century used to do interesting things with pastry and make beautiful sculptures with pastry, with flowers and birds and all those things. And people wore beautiful floral textiles and it was all very fresh. Right. And wallpapers. and Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah exactly. So we sorted it out for them in the end. That's it. I'd say I'd, tr I'd troubleshoot things like that. If you've got something that is it's not selling as well as you expected it to, or it seems to do okay in one country, but then not, not the next one. Or even if you're trying to launch a new brand and you just really don't even know where to start, I'm a really good person to talk to because I can see how to convey messages to the public that they're going to enjoy. Right. And I think anybody listening to, I, and I love the way you introduced this in the book and you did very similarly here, is when you hear it all explained, it's like, that sounds classy. That sounds nice. I, I Why wouldn't people want this high quality jam, right? And then you get the comparison, you go, oh, right. Like, I get it now. And you, so now we're, you know, in retrospect, like them, right? Like th those silly people, I wouldn't have made that mistake. But try to remember what, like, you know, before your curse of knowledge here, <laughs> like when you didn't know that you thought that sounded really classy and the things that people could be doing in their own brands, if they don't take the time to think about that symbolism, how it ties in something, you know, where have I seen this before being an important question? It's a hugely important question. And, you know, it's like, if you're, if you can't afford to hire somebody to do some ethics for you, but you want to design your own brands, then I need to say to people, try and trust your instincts. You know, if you're looking at the shop that you've just designed or the market store or the flyer that you've just designed or whatever it may be, and it's almost perfect, but there's just something niggling at the back of your mind that's making you feel a tiny little bit uncomfortable. You need to take that seriously and follow it up until you find out what it is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that you don't invest thousands of pounds or dollars in making a funeral parlour, a really nice funeral parlour, <laughs> 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 when what you were hoping for was to sell some jam. Because after they'd been selling funerals, it would have been amazing, you know. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now you know what to do for those clients when they come around and want to have <laughs> inspiration. <laughs> 
I haven't yet found any funeral parlours that look like sweet shops, you know. So. Well, yeah, maybe not <laughs> I'll, yet. I will celebrate if I do find one. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, so there are, I believe, 12 questions in the book that you say, you know, that you want to be asking. Is there another of your kind of like a favorite question or one that has a really good lesson or story with it that you would want to share? Yeah, let me think about it. From I know. Age. I'm sure that you love all of them yeah, yeah, equally, yeah, them. right? Because you work with them so much. But <laughs> so, where have I seen this before? Is a favorite one because it's one that my clients can start to use straight away. You know, mm-hmm. I love to teach, and I'm not. Um, I mean, I wouldn't write books if I wanted to keep this stuff to myself, right? I, to share up, semiotics is a very shareable skill, and it gives me a lot of pleasure to be able to share it with people. So. Uh, this question, where have I seen this before, is um, very sort of user-friendly for people who are beginning with semiotics. I suppose another one that I quite like, that I use a lot, is where there is choice, there is meaning. Mm-hmm. And uh, so to quickly explain what that means, this is these all these questions which you identify in uh, sort of chapter 12 of my new book on retail these are the tools that I use every single day at work, right? Where the, no matter what kind of a brand I happen to be thinking about, and I work in many different categories, there are certain sort of questions and prompts which I will use every single day, right? And these, these are some of them. So these prompts then, where there is choice, there is meaning, what does that mean? So um, I'm trying to think of an example that will sort of be relevant and not too controversial. Let's talk about Donald Trump's hair. <laughs> 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 yeah, not too controversial. Not too controversial yeah. <laughs> so he's kind of it's a particular color. It's not white, is it? It's got a kind of blonde tint to it. You know what I mean? It's also not black and he's not he's not bald, right? Right. And um he wears it in this kind of bouffant comb over. And so this phrase where there is choice, there is meaning, re- reminds me. <laughs> That when it comes to Donald Trump's hair, there's two ways of looking at it. On the one hand, you could just say, well, that's his hair, right? Nature designed it that way. Or you could say, well, no, Trump's hair looks like that because he chose that. That's what he chose, right? He probably had it professionally styled. Yes. Spends a lot of money for that weird hairstyle. Spends a lot of money, right? And he's 100% in control of what colour it is and what the style is and stuff like that, right? So where there is choice, there is meaning. Donald Trump has styled and coloured his hair in that exact way because it means something. So I guess we could leave it maybe to our listeners to figure out what it means, but just to offer a sort of few clues, right? So the big kind of puffed up bouffant is a way of, a lot of older men do this, the big comb overs. It's a sign of youthful virility, isn't it? It's like, look, I'm not bald. Look how much hair I've still got. You know, I look how vital I still am, you know, with this energetic kind of cloud of hair above his head, you know. But also it's blonde. I have no idea whether that's his natural colour. At least his age, he must surely be naturally grey by now, I would have thought. But um, but he appears to dye it this sort of blonde shade. And that's as though to, I suppose, um, I can't help thinking that it's he's making a point about how white he is. You know, it's not a hair colour that's shared with other ethnic groups, is that? And so, and, and when, once you once you move on from, from his hair, you start to get into the things like the permatan that he wears, and and he's you know his, his suits and stuff like that. So, so Trump, like every public figure, is um, a collection of quite carefully curated semiotic signs, none of which are there by accident. Right? Mm-hmm. And where there's choice, there's meaning, right? So if he looks a certain way, it's because he chose to, because he's trying to tell you something. So my job is to figure out what people are trying to say. By the way, <laughs> what we're talking about hair, I'm 100% certain that you've seen the, um, frankly, hilarious videos of um, Jeff Bezos and uh, um, Leonardo DiCaprio and Bezos' girlfriend. Have you seen this? I haven't, but I'll, I'll have to go check it out. Oh, after. my Lord, you are in for such a treat. You are in for such <laughs> a treat. Right? So it was, I think the story just broke yesterday or something. It was like the most fun semiotic thing I've seen in a while. Oh, right? <laughs> okay, so listen, I'm an Amazon shopper like everybody else, okay? So I'm not in a position to kind of criticise Jeff, and I feel a bit sorry for him, actually, but here's what happened. So Jeff's girlfriend is a uh, TV personality whose name you might recognise, been on your side of the Atlantic, Lauren something. 
And um, they were at, uh, she and Jeff were, she's been his girlfriend for ages, right? I think from since before when he used to be married to Mackenzie Scott. So Lauren's his girlfriend now. You're looking at these images, aren't you? I can tell from your face. <laughs> so they were an event. There's, you need to watch the video because the video is unbelievable. Yeah. But him and his girlfriend are at this event and they meet with um, Leonardo DiCaprio. Now, at the time that this little five seconds of video is shot, DiCaprio happens to be standing on a kind of stage or a dais. So it makes him look about six foot taller than the pair of them, right? So he's right. he's like a god, right? <laughs> <laughs> he's already tall, so he's he's broad, you know, and he's standing there staring down at those two miniature people. <laughs> and uh, uh, Lauren, Bezos' girlfriend, he looks like she wants to climb Leonardo DiCaprio, <laughs> right? She's thirsty, just not really quite cover it. <laughs> she, it's like this is the most exciting and arousing thing that's ever happened to her, you know? And, and her, you know, I, I hear that he's very popular and much popular with the ladies, so I don't blame her, you know. Yeah. And then you've got, um, it's a very striking image, though, because then you've got Jeff standing next to her. And because of the way that this has happened with DiCaprio on this stage, Bezos comes up as really short and skinny and very bald. And he's kind of, there's some very fascinating photographs. The photographs are really of uh, Lauren kind of gazing adoringly at um, DiCaprio and sort of thrusting her chest at him. Mm-hmm. But what's really makes these photos special is Jeff Bezos in the foreground, a man who's like the second richest guy in the world and kind of invincible, you know. Yeah. And he's kind of got his eyes closed. He sort of slightly turns away from the two of them. He's like this <laughs> to shield his own eyes <laughs> yeah. from the scene that's unfolding in front of him, right? So it's been much discussed on social media and all this kind of thing, and everybody thought it was jolly funny, right? Because what's more funny than when a billionaire, you know, <laughs> yes. has an embarrassing moment in public, right? Yeah. But, uh, many people commented on um, his appearance. You know, they said things like, well, uh, at the end of the day, what, they said what this, this photo in this five-second video proves, some guys, some men said this. They said it proves that no matter how much money you have, money will never trump good looks. You know, <laughs> Bezos, second richest man in the world. Um, DiCaprio, worth a mere 260 million. Lame. If you're interested, that's what I, nothing, right? <laughs> I've got that down the back of the sofa. <laughs> <laughs> so apparently DiCaprio is worth about, let me get the, the numbers right, 0.013% of what Jeff Bezos is worth. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so some men were like, "Well, this proves it. Fine, that settles the argument forever." You know right. what I mean? A lot of people <laughs> commented uh, on on um, Bezos' appearance and said things like, "Well, you know, I never realised how short he was, although he's not really that short in real life." And um, they commented on his baldness. Now, you wouldn't think that was relevant, so why bring it up? Well, it's relevant in the same way that Donald Trump's hair is relevant. If Trump deliberately styles his hair. So that he's got the bouffants and and uh, all this kind of uh, vigor <laughs> coming out of his scalp, then um, Bezos, who who knows if he chose to shave his hair off or not, probably not, right? Nonetheless, the surface of his head is a semiotic sign. Yeah, all the all the things to keep in mind. I love that we, you know, so there was some of uh, specific, you know, so actual brands we have some personal brands here that we talked about with the signs and symbols and i know that i could definitely just talk to you all day about all the signs and things that exist but of course for everybody who is listening they can just go pick up one of these two books that exists uh because as as i said this is going to be coming out right after semiotics in retail comes out and semiotics and marketing already is into the world so for everyone who is ready to go get their copies and to learn more from you or that want to work with you what are the best ways for them to get in touch and to learn more all right then whether you're a brand owner or you work in advertising or if you're just interested in humans doing crazy things, <laughs> <laughs> then, um, of course, one place you can get my book is on Amazon. Sorry, Jeff. I'm really sorry I said all that. <laughs> <laughs> but if, until he cancels me, <laughs> yeah. you can get this book on Amazon.com <laughs> and around the world. Um, or if you prefer um, to shop elsewhere, um, you can purchase from all good local booksellers. Or you could go online and buy direct from my publisher, which is koganpage.com. That's K-O-G-A-N, 
P-A-G-E dot com. You can buy it straight from there. And then if people want to um, contact me personally, I'm on Twitter. Um, I'm on LinkedIn as Dr. Rachel Laws, in one word. Perfect. All right. Well, we will have those linked all in the show notes. And I believe also it's rachellawsconsulting.com. Lawsconsulting.co.uk. Ah, yeah. See, totally not what I said at all. So laws, <laughs> been there, but... <laughs> Laws-consulting.co.uk. Perfect. But honestly, just Googling my name is probably the easiest way to find me. Mm-hmm. Well, but we'll also link in the show notes. So make it nice and easy for everybody. And now I have to go look at all the signs and symbols in my own life and see what my personal brand is saying. <laughs> exactly. And come back and tell me about that, right? And I'll be able to tell you what they all mean. <laughs> Will do. Thanks so much for joining me. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was great. Thanks for having me on the show. Thank you again to Dr. Rachel Laws for joining me on the show today. What got your brain buzzing in today's conversation? I know I gushed about it a bunch at the beginning of the episode and during, who am I kidding? (laughs) But I really love everything to do with semiotics and I'm borderline obsessed with the topic right now. For everyone who is listening and finding themselves equally amazed and intrigued, get your copy of Using Semiotics in Marketing and Using Semiotics in Retail or both. There are links for you in the show notes, as well as related past episodes, articles, and ways to connect with Rachel and I all within the app you're listening to or at the brainybusiness.com slash 191. As you take a moment to reflect, what was your favorite insight from the show? Give Rachel a shout out on Twitter. She's Dr. Rachel Laws, which is D-R-R-A-C-H-E-L- L-A-W-E-S, and I'm the Brainy Biz to start a conversation about it. Those handles are, of course, linked for you in those show notes as well at thebrainybusiness.com slash 191. And if you enjoy the experience I've provided here for you, will you share about it? That could mean leaving a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever else you listen, sharing this episode or any other with a friend who you think would find value in the insights or even hitting that subscribe button if you haven't already. Thank you so much in advance. I appreciate it and you. Thank you again to Dr. Rachel Laws for joining me on the show today to discuss using semiotics in retail. It was a delight to chat with and learn from you. Join me next week for another brainy episode of The Brainy Business. It's going to be a lot of fun. You won't want to miss it. Until then, thanks again for listening and learning with me. And remember to be thoughtful. Thank you for listening to the Brainy Business Podcast. Melina offers virtual strategy sessions, workshops, and other services to help businesses be more brain friendly. For more free resources, visit thebrainybusiness.com.